Uh, welcome to another early episode of Mark My Bird. Uh, my name is Mark Clavin. I am here with my co-host, T-Bird. How's it going, everybody? Uh, T-Bird, any, anything new this week? Are we still doing these questions? Anything new this week? Yeah, I'll tell you what. Uh, spring break in Oregon is officially over, so Louie's back in school. Um, but I had a a pretty like incredible moment on Saturday with my daughter, which was incredible. We went up to Mount Hood Meadows. And she took her first ever snowboard lesson, which I always said she didn't need. Um, but she was in the lesson for two hours. And she emerged from the lesson learning more in two hours than I've managed to try to teach her in six fucking years. Like, she learned so much. And then she snowboarded. She started at 9 a.m. Her lesson was done at 11. We took a quick lunch break. And then she literally rode until, like, the magic carpet and the lifts closed. Like, she wanted to go back up. And I was like, Louie... I don't think she understood that a mountain closed. I was like, hey, they're done. Like the lifts have stopped turning. And so that for me, I don't know, just personal life shit. That was like the greatest moment I've ever had as a parent, I think. I mean, those that can't do teach and then those that can't teach become journalists. So you are the uh, <laughs> the bottom of the pool. Oh, and if you hear that laugh, uh, we do have a guest again today. Since we still don't know what we're doing with this podcast, um, a quick intro. Let's see. Uh, I, I wrote one this time, um, so I'm going to try this. A Salt Lake City transplant turned Salt Lake royalty in just a few short years. Uh, didn't do much research, but I'm pretty sure she has Rookie of the Year, Rider of the Year, Video Part of the Year. Uh, definitely has a cover that we all saw two years ago, something like that. Um, dare I say fashion icon, a member of the highly lauded ride snowboard team. A massive character in snowboarding today, which makes sense because her father drew characters for Disney for many years, um, and now a washed up high school basketball player. Uh, welcome to our podcast, Jill Perkins. Wow, that is quite the intro, Mark. Thank you so much. You touched on things that I forgot about and chose to forget about. Um, thank you for having me. I, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm hyped for you guys. This is awesome. Um, Bert, I do want to say, though, you know, maybe I don't think maybe you're not the problem. Maybe Louie just doesn't want to learn from you. And yeah, that well, it's funny. Someone once told me a long time ago that like the parent will see the absolute best and the absolute worst of their child because you have like they're you are the their full emotional spectrum. But when you look at like a teacher or a snowboard instructor or even another parent, they only kind of see that middle ground, right? Like when I was trying to teach Louie how to stop she would get super frustrated and really, really upset because she's comfortable around me. But when the her coach, Colin, this like 22-year-old just frother of a kid, when he tried to do it and Louie fell, she wasn't going to let him see that side of her. So I think I had that that kind of unlocked with me um, when we put Louie in public school because, you know, I'd ask her teacher, like, does she get super frustrated when she can't read a word? And her teacher's like, no. Maybe with you, but not with me. So that's kind of where I landed. Yeah. Maybe I should teach Louie how to snowboard because every time I've seen her in my entire life, she has just burst into tears. So she is not comfortable with me at all. <laughs> I have a, a, a an album in my phone of just Mark holding Louie as a baby and Mark's laughing and Louie's scream crying. Yeah. You know what, Mark? Time will, the time will come and she's going to love Uncle Mark. She's going to love Uncle yeah. Mark. She, she already does like idolize Jill and a lot of uh, pro snowboarders for that matter because I show her stuff on my phone all the time. But she she met Jill, I think, last summer or the summer before. Yeah, and she was, Mark, I will say she was terrified of me as well. She would like hide behind Lauren's leg, but then she would like peek out every once in a while. It was, you know, we're, it's, a, it's, a, it's a waiting game. It's slow. Yeah. I've learned but, thing. Take your time. But Jilly, as soon as you left for like a week, she's like, where's Jill? I'm like, she's back in Salt Lake, dude. You like you you missed your shot. Louie. You yeah. blew it, Louie. <laughs> Going back to the intro, Mark, kudos, my friend. That was way better than my my intro in episode one. You might have to take over all intros from now on. You are you are the host. Then we're okay learning the pecking order. Yeah, as oh. we as we do it, which probably is not the smartest, but yeah, we'll figure it. <laughs> Um, and then Jilly, real quick, not to shower you with more praise, but I just need to put it on the record. You are literally one of my favorite people on earth. I love the shit out of you, and I'm so stoked that you joined us here today. Thank you, Bird. Yep, love you too. We miss you. We miss you over at the big R, but 
I don't even, not the big R, that's just at rides. The, the backwards R, the backwards R. We miss you at rides, snowboards. No, it was, I mean, it was the best eight years of my life. Um, but I've just kind of hit a point where like, once I moved to Portland, I was kind of like, shit, it's a little tougher to be a snowboard photographer. And I just kind of called Jim and it was, it was a mutual like, Hey man, it's been fun as hell. We built something pretty incredible and I'm just stoked to watch what you all do with it because watching like what that team started as and what it's become as what I think is the coolest team in snowboarding, um, is fucking awesome and what a way to go out too with rated r that movie was fucking epic it was wait jill how long how long have you been on ride since 2016 to 17 like the summer of 16 i think i was like was in contact summer of 16 and then like okay. yeah yeah so i mean you've come up with like the new team very like you've yeah, been, been there the whole time now yeah. almost a decade almost a decade i know i know i think about that and it's so cool like just Everybody like, you know, everybody was like friends, but everyone's like now like family. And I think that's really cool. Like I'm, I'm definitely like very proud to be a part of it. Um, and the opportunities that they've given us all and like a lot of us to do things together and not like, like really like, like segregating the crew. It's, it's been awesome. We've, we've had what was, the best run. What was your last trip with bird? Like you, like I, I technically I know. Okay. So yeah, bird is not with ride. Cause he wanted this amazing opportunity to do this podcast. Totally. Um, <laughs> yeah but either way you guys did i mean you guys will probably go on more trips in the future but what was that last trip like the last trip i went on with t-bird was it was it was awesome i mean like it was we were in minnesota i believe that was the one right bird yeah minnesota uh, has always been so good to the ride crew yeah we were in minnesota t-bird t-bird and t-bird came out with me one day and shot uh, a photo one of the only photos i got last year so ha happy it was with bird um and it was sick i mean like the weather the weather wasn't awesome at the beginning it got a lot better as as the week went on i mean just like having it, it's always special like having t-bird around just because of like the history and him being a part of the team and like having the whole team in minnesota where we've all been and familiar and some people are from there you know it was just like it felt it didn't feel like outstretched you know like we weren't far from home and yet we had like our family together so it was it was awesome do you jilly do you remember the first time we met and shot together in salt lake if i think really hard and find, i mean I'm trying so to think I'll tell you, it was oh, it was in sugar house park oh my gosh yes yes and yeah. Des was filming and yeah. and helping you build the spot the landing and whatnot and shoveling for you and I, I forget how I found out about it. Maybe Tanner had been like, oh, Jill's going to shoot this thing. Here's her number. And I'll never forget after, I think you got it in like five or six tries. It was that like tail tap back one off the roof of that. Yeah, weird, weird trick selection, but the photos are so great. <laughs> yeah, and I, I thought the trick was so fucking sick. And I remember calling Tanner on the drive home and being like, yo, this girl is fucking insanely good at snowboarding. I was so hyped up. I think I was more afraid to walk on the roof than I was to snowboard off of it, which yeah. I, I that that is that still marks true. I'm like scared of roofs. They're slippery and like snowboard boots don't like I don't know. You can slip off that thing so quick. You're on a roof with like snow and ice. Yeah, go. Like, that's a natural fear. I don't think that's uh that's. I think everyone should be afraid of being on roofs. In absolutely, snow. absolutely. Yeah. Going back to Mark's intro, washed up high school basketball player. Did you play basketball in high school? I did play basketball. I'm actually wearing basketball shorts right now, and I'm hyped on them. Utah Jazz. Hell yeah. yeah. Let's go. Um, I played yeah. basketball in high school. You know, I kind of grew up playing all sports, and then in, and I didn't play basketball before high school. I think I played when I was, like, six. Didn't, you know, it was like, here's the ball. Like, there's the net. Like, the nets are, like, the little ones that are, like, on the ground, you know? Um, So that didn't really count. But then I, I played soccer for a while before that. Like, in through middle school, I played club soccer. Wasn't wasn't that good at it. It wasn't bad, but I wasn't like where I wanted to be as an athlete, I guess. Um, so when I went to high school, I was like, oh, I'll try basketball. Like, let's do it. And so yeah, I played basketball. Uh, I ended up I ended up like loving it, and I and and I loved the sport. I loved the team dynamic. Um, I ended up we like did really well. One a couple years actually, senior year. We went to like I don't know, I don't know. We went to I don't even know the name of it anymore. That's how. 
not to date myself here, but uh, <laughs> like champs kind of stuff or what? Yeah, like CIF. I think it's CIF champions, like all that. We didn't end up winning, but we we made it through a couple rounds. Um, and it was cool. And I remember, like, that was my life for sure. Like basketball, I was convinced that I like loved it. I just like like sports. I was like, whether I play basketball or like want to become a physical therapist for a team, I just I really enjoyed it. So I played in high school, and I did like club out of high school to like just like you know just because I liked it and I was like oh like I could play this in school like I can go to school and play this um and it was like local like not not like definitely not D- division one teams or anything like that but there was like some some teams like there was a like couple I think I had like a d2 and then a couple like d3s and I just decided like I'll just go to community college I'll play basketball and then hopefully get like scholared out to a D1 from there. Like I, this was what I thought was going to be the path. Um, Dude, that's crazy. Simultaneously, it's like when I, like that was senior year and simultaneously I was getting into snowboarding and I just realized that I like really like snowboarding and I still really liked basketball, but I would like put off, I started putting basketball off to go snowboarding. Um, anyway, so then I started going to Moore Park College, which didn't last long. Then I went to Ventura College and I was like Wait, playing so- you did you did end up playing you played college level basketball i i didn't even get to the season because i like my coach basically gave me the ultimate i mean first of all high school basketball versus college basketball is not the same thing like like, all american like it's it's not like the girls were all of a sudden three times as tall as me and i'm i'm five nine five ten like in high school i was like i wasn't the tallest but i wasn't the shortest and i can i was like versatile um, but then you go to college and these girls are like six two at least, you know, and just like, like big bodied, like I was a baby, like I was like getting tossed around and it was, it was really hard. And I was like, kind of like, you know, like not really into it. I also think, you know, you play it, you play at a community college and the dynamic is different because it's yes, you're a team, but also everybody's like fighting for a spot to get out of there. Oh, yeah. uh, Opposed to like you get on it, and I don't know because I didn't do this, but I would imagine like you you play for UConn or something, and like all of a sudden like you're you're like sponsored in this team, this family, and like sure you have to like work your way up, but like you're so you've solidified you've solidified a spot at the table. Then I think I don't really know. Um, so it was like highly competitive against your own teammates, and I just like again simultaneously snowboarding. I just was like over it. My coach was like you can't, he basically was like, you can't snowboard if you want to do this. And I kind of was like, yeah, I think I'm just going to snowboard. <laughs> yeah. I, I covered a JUCO team actually for like a year, like yeah. when I was doing photography in college and those kids were so competitive with each other. Like, yeah. it was, and they were all super good. They were all trying to get scholarships anywhere else. A yeah. couple of them ended up getting picked up, but yeah, like it was not like a, as soon as you go back in the locker room, like those kids are screaming at each other. Like, give me the ball. It was it was pretty fun. Yeah, because yeah, it it, it, it goes from like on a on a D one or like professional level, you're a team working for a common goal. But when you're at that kind of community college JUCO level, you're an individual trying to get to the next step. Yeah, it was like probably one of the most cutthroat experiences that I've ever had. I mean, I think I mean, but it makes sense. Like, like I I get it. And if I was again, like I was okay. Like I like. I wasn't, I wasn't great by any means. I was not the best. And it just made, like, I just, the time, and I've been doing it for so long at that point, or I guess, you know, four years. And I don't know, it just, I, I like the, my love for snowboarding really just trumps like the amount of energy I wanted to give to junior college basketball. Even though that one really wasn't a team sport, I guess, just because everyone was at their each other's. Did you do you like team sports? Like, I do. or do you like kind of like how snowboarding operates, where you're kind of finding your own stuff in the streets and doing that? I mean, I think there's beauty in both. I think I I think snowboarding, arguably, for some, is you know, I guess to relate it back to ride, like it is a team sport in a way, and it's. I mean. Like, on paper, maybe it's not, but like when you create those bonds with people, it becomes a team sport. And ultimately, I think that family or that team that you create, like that gives you so much more purpose or it gives me a lot more purpose now. And it wasn't maybe wasn't always like this because I didn't have that home to, you know, like that's what really gets me fired up is like the collective community amongst it all instead of it just being such an individual sport. And I think it snowboarding allows you to have both. 
Like you, you, you are your, you are yourself, you are an individual, but you also are capable of like being there for others and others are there for you. So I've, and you're, and you're on multiple teams. Multiple like, teams. Yeah. That's gotta be hard to juggle. Sorry, Bird. No, I've, I was going to say, I, I've always kind of seen that because I'm into team sports as well. I love mainstream uh, sports because I'm a like kind of a secret jock in a weird way. But I've always seen competitive snowboarding as very individualistic, like X Games, Natural Selection Tour, all that stuff, because you're just it's you versus everybody else. But either in backcountry or street snowboarding, when you're filming a video part, you're a fucking team. You're finding spots for other people. You're shoveling for other people because you're all working toward, I mean, granted, you want to, you are, I feel like secretly, you probably want opener or ender. Like you want your footage to be the best, but it's not the end of the world if it's not, right? All, the only thing that matters is putting a really good product as a whole out to the general public for you and your team. Totally. Mark, were you going to say something? No, I was going to say, I'm, I'm going to talk less. You guys are both uh, very insightful about this Uh just team snowboarding and all that stuff. It's pretty. I mean, this isn't just three jocks on a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think, I mean, I think you're right. And also like looking at street snow. I mean, I agree with the competition side. I don't spend a lot of time over there, but I, you know, a couple of times a year get the pleasure to meet with like competitors, you know, at due tour or anything like that. And, and just like witnessing their mindset and like how they go about the competition is super interesting to me. And it's inspiring in one way. I'm, I am glad that I don't do it. It seems very difficult. Um, but yeah, it's like at this, like one thing to know, I think for listeners or people that aren't familiar with street snowboarding, like you, you, you could go by yourself to a park or to a spot and set it up and snowboard on it. But like, not really, like you kind of need a team. Like you definitely, you definitely need a team. Like for shoveling, for filming, for help, for watching for traffic, for fixing the landing. I don't know. It, it's it's 100%, I would say, the act of doing it is, like, very team-oriented. Um, and I think as far as, like, like I was saying earlier, like, it, it does, but it also, like, nurtures the part of it where you can be an individual. And I think that's really cool because you you get the opportunity to, like, be somebody like and be who you want to be and like do things how you want to do it like you have the create you like it really shows that like, creativity and that's pretty individual um with being able to like bounce ideas off of friends and peers and and people you're writing i feel like the one time in or the the multiple times in snowboard history when street riding became super competitive was like the the og real snow days because it would be one rider, one filmer, and then that rider and filmer would hire hire like a like a shovel crew, and yeah. so it'd be like, so it became so individualistic, and that to me made it feel super competitive. Yeah, and you can kind of see that in like, not not all of them, like this, not to like put all of the people who participated in that into a box, but like you could see a difference in those video parts from when they were filming with people and when they were filming with like people working for them. And I think that's that's kind of interesting. Uh, what, as far as individualistic stuff, you don't have to wear a jersey. Although I would like to see a Moore Park uh, Community College jersey for a clip maybe in your next part. I actually, I, I don't, I actually almost brought my, I have my high school uniforms at my parents' house. So I almost brought them home. But I was like, these are going to get shoved in a basket somewhere and probably yeah. be on display. So, but it's yeah. cool to still have them. That would be sick. You walk into your house, you just have your high school jerseys. <laughs> like, on no, we didn't win anything. No, yeah. I don't play basketball, but it's here. Like, you put on, like a mannequin right in like your foyer when you walk in. People are I like, I actually Ooh. have a mannequin right here, and it is hoisting up my cowboy hat and the scarves that I've made. So, um, Jilly, going back to uh, like what you said about you know making that step up in basketball, did you find that same? thing happen in snowboarding meaning like you probably started out doing like usasas and local contests but once you took the step into like sponsored video part snowboarder did you did you think the same thing like holy shit all these people are so fucking good at snowboarding yes i mean simple answer yeah everyone is super good at snowboarding and they just continuously get better like the you know um especially nowadays like just seeing all the girls and like having like 
events like the uninvited and all this stuff like you in the internet um you just see so much more and i think for me it all just kind of like lined itself up in the sense of like i moved to utah and then i was working for i was helping out at the four horsemen um showroom it was like the local it was josh fisher and like they did they did like burton and anon and like all all this a bunch of other stuff too but you bought a two-wheel drive truck right i brought i had a two-wheel drive truck in california just because i have always liked trucks yeah um and cars i guess i'm kind of a car person i'm, I'm like slowly figuring out but Two-wheel drive truck didn't make it out. Like it wasn't good. I my one of my first jobs out here was like up in Park City in a two-wheel drive car. And I had like sandbags in the back of my truck because it was at a coffee shop and I'd have to drive up the canyon at like it I had to be there sometimes at like five. So I'd leave at 4 30 and like in the snow. And like coming from SoCal, like I did not know how to drive in the snow. And I and I and I I hate driving the snow still. Like it like stresses me out so much. Um just from like other like car accident traumas, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, so yeah, quickly got rid of the two wheel drive Tacoma, the short bed two wheel drive Tacoma. That was a, that was just a flex, I guess. <laughs> it was not practical. Uh, I almost, but, I, we talked about, I almost bought that off you. We DM'd for a couple of days and then I was like, oh wait, it's two wheel drive. I don't yeah, know. I was like, you don't, you're not going to want this. Like even in, I brought it to summer camp the first year and like I had to park in like the dirt lot and like if it rained in Oregon, I couldn't leave. It's like, this doesn't, this doesn't make any sense. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think it was funny because when I first started snowboarding, whatever, like, of course there was, you Google snowboarding and like, or like, I quickly found out about USASA. I was like dating this kid whose dad ran like our region for it, like Bear and uh, Mountain High, like where I first started snowboarding. And so my first year of snowboarding, they're like, oh, you should just do this. And I was like, Hell yeah, I'll do it because at this point I'm Googling like top female snowboarders and like it was still, and this is 2012 and he was still saying like Hannah Teeter was on the list. And I mean, still like some of the, like the go, like Jamie Anderson was on there, obviously. Anna Beeman was on there. I remember that. Lee Amplosi, like Marie Francois, like, but also just like, like the Hannah Teeters and like the people that like did snowboard, but don't anymore, but they were still listed. Um, but that was the only like grasp of knowledge that I could like get my hands on. Cause I didn't even know what to Google. Like I couldn't, I didn't even know what a video part was. So it yeah, Googling and that was hard. So like, I thought, cause like, I like to snowboard, like competition is like the only thing, you know? And I was like, okay, like coming from, um, team sports, like the competition, like that, that resonated in my mind. Um, so I did that. And then I, the first year it was like only me in the heat. So I got invited to nationals cause I, it was like one out of one gold and they're like, wow, your stats are really good. And I'm like, yeah. So then I went to nationals and it was at copper. My dad and I went and, um, I competed and I was the only one that could clear the jump because it was like snowing and I was the biggest one. Cause I was competing against that basketball frame. Did, yeah. 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 I had that basketball frame. Um, <laughs> I think I, I got second because I like wasn't good and like one girl was like do, did a trick and I just cleared the jump with like a a nindy like <laughs> I, didn't even know, I didn't even know the grabs but I remember I had this photo and I'm like in my USA bib like it's like snowing like the photo is so bad I could probably find it um so that was that and like doing that contest I met this girl Haley Mattingly and I don't know if she still snowboards. I'm sure she does. She was she was a, a little ripper. She was younger than me. She was like, but she crushed it. And I was like, oh. And she kind of like, we, I was like in her hotel room. It was her and her dad in Mammoth. And she like showed me too hard, actually. And like, she's like, oh, street snowboarding. Like, so at this point I was like, oh, I, I want to snowboard. Like my boyfriend and I at the time had just broken up. And I either want to go to Colorado or Utah. She's like, well, I live in Utah. And I like, oh my gosh, I think so often. I think the heavens that I moved to Utah and not Colorado. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. I would have been a different breed. I don't know. I couldn't tell you where I would be. Maybe on a week. Wait, yeah. Hold on. Expand on that. Utah versus Colorado. Why? Um, why do you think the heavens? Because I also think Chelsea Waddell because so the timeline as it, as it was, was I, you know, got into snowboarding. I was dating kid. Did, did USASA, uh, learned about high cascade for the summer, went to High Cascade and I met Chelsea. She worked in the office. I met Danica, I met Nirvana, Corinne, Alexa McCarty, like like those girls. Um, and this was after like like watching too hard and like not really knowing much about it, but I was like, oh, that looks sick. Like they look like they have fun. Like that that's cool. Um, 
So I met them and I kind of got to know them. And at the end of my session, because I was like, a, I was like a, I was part of the camp. I wasn't like working for them at the time. I asked like, hey, I can only afford to be at this session, but I would love like, do you guys need help in the kitchen? Like anything? And like they asked and like, it was like the end of the year and it like just didn't really work out. But I made those connections and they all lived in Utah. So then I stayed in touch with Chelsea and I remember calling her and I was like, hey, like I'm thinking about moving to Colorado or Utah. And she was like very non-biased at the time. I mean, she probably like, chuckled a little bit and nothing against Colorado like I like going there every time I go there I feel a little sick like can't really breathe or anything but it's cool I enjoy going um and she just coming from California I think I was drawn to like the airport's really close there's a city like I'm not living in like a mountain town and I think it, it was just like an easier adjustment for me um and with like going to school like I, I was convinced that I was gonna like move to Utah get residency go to the U like I was taking a couple classes online at Slick and still at Moore Park. Um, so it just like made more sense. And uh, also like I've been here now for like 10 years. So I think I made the right decision. Well, and it's also you're if you move to Colorado and you want to be a contest snowboarder, I think that's the move. Sure. If you, okay. move, if you move to Colorado, I think you're pretty limited in being a street snowboarder. If you have travel budget, you can travel and go on trips. But in Salt Lake City, when it snows... Your your training ground is just the city. I still was like this. Was, I agree with you, Bird. I think I still didn't know what street snowboarding really was, um, and so I think moving to Salt Lake like nurtured me and kind of like pushed me down that path, which ultimately like makes a lot more sense for me as a person and who who I am. Like I like it just it just kind of like makes sense. Um, yeah, that, yeah, that's a good. That's definitely. Yeah. What um what was the first street spot you ever hit and what was the trick first street spot i ever hit i went to saint george with i think i mean like rail gardens but i don't know if you want to count that i definitely like went to rail gardens just having that like kind of in our backyard here in utah um but first like trip and street spot i went with madison blackley john bloom i think it was just us three we met up with uh i think Pat, St. George, the Fava, or Cedar City. Yes, it was Cedar City. It wasn't St. George. The Favas lived there. So we went and I hit some spots there. And I think the first one was like this, like, it was like this, like, down ledge. But there was like a rail on the down ledge. And then it continued into the ledge. Um, and I hit that. And then I did a 5-0 on a rail. And I still have that photo, too, somewhere I can find. But I was hyped on the 5-0. I was like, this is, and the rail was probably like, six feet <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious but uh and then i and then i had a nice front one to taco on a down rail and i was like ooh, I'm never doing a front one again you haven't seen me do one since i can guarantee you that how excited were your parents when you're like guys i'm not going to try to become a professional basketball player i'm going to become a professional snowboarder when i don't even know what street snowboarding is <laughs> i you know i think i kind of bamboozled them and also myself like i didn't really know I really didn't know that I wanted to do that. Like, I know I liked it and I was like looking into it. But when I was first getting into it, I was like pretty like, I want, I like snowboarding. I want to get good at snowboarding, but I'm going to go to school for like sports science and like health and nutrition and like business, like, like what is that? Uh, like business and sports marketing. So I was like doing that. I was like kind of taking the classes. I mean, it was still like low level, like, uh, like qualifiers, like to get into or like prereqs to get into with that. But simultaneously, I was like, getting better at snowboarding um so like they thought I was like moving here to like find myself and like go to school and like I remember my dad being like okay like you've been there for a year now like what's your plan I was like well like there's these awards like I really want to win rookie of the year and like kind of see like I'm getting like support it wasn't even like money really at the time um but I'm making friends and like I was I was like undeniably like happy and I was like you know learning something new and like kind of at a rapid rate because I was so excited about it and it was so new to me. Um, so then once they, my dad was like, they, but my parents have always been super supportive. I think he was just more concerned that I wasn't just like, like ski bumming. And I think I was for a second, but then I told, when I told him, he's like, what do you, he asked me what my goals were. And I was like, well, I want to win rookie of the year with, he's like, what are your goals for the next three years? And so when that happened, I remember him calling me and like kind of like laughing and he's like, okay, well, like you did it. Like what's next kind of thing. And I was like, okay, well like now I want to do this. And like, it just, we have a relationship where like, we'll like bounce that off each other. And like, he gives me the respected space that it needs. And and now they just, they get it. They, they like understand. 
if they had it their way, I would be home a lot more. But, you know, I tell them, I'm like, I'm home more than somebody who has a desk job, you know? And at what point, you know, fast forwarding, maybe a year, a couple of years, at what point were you and your parents like, holy shit, this is working. Like I kind of making it right now. What was that like? Um, hmm, that's tricky because of the support that they've like, they've, my mom has always really been my biggest fan. So like the smallest thing, I mean, she's responding to everything on online that she gets the chance to, which is everything. Um, so they've always been, I'm so fortunate to have parents that have always yep. been pretty. Like, what, is your, what does your mom do for work? Sorry. My mom now works at anthropology in the mall and she loves it. Okay, cool. Um, but she was a flight attendant for a lot of years and then she was an esthetician kind of, kind of all over the place. Um, but now she, she's like a social person. So she loves like being in like the fashion, like clothes, the work, like she loves that. She's obsessed with it. So shout out mom. Um, it would, it would be very funny if your dad who worked at Disney, AKA a dreamer was like, no, I don't want you to go after this snowboard dream. No, he was, he was like always, he doesn't work there anymore. He worked there for so many years. Now he's like semi-retired and teaches and he's, he's crushing it, but he's always like He's also always been my biggest fan. I, I played hockey for a long time when I was a kid. And he would, I remember my, I liked playing goalie. Like that was like my favorite. I was either like a forward or I was a goalie. And he would like sit behind the net, like behind the boards pretty much. And he was just like talking to me the whole time. Like all, not, not like an intense dad, but like, he's like, you're a tiger. I'm like, I'm a tiger. <laughs> Do you think, <laughs> um, are you more like your mom or more like your dad? Ooh, I would say a blend, a blend of both for sure. I think the older I get, I think I'm I'm goal oriented like my dad, and I'm social like my mom. And my dad is also a social person, but he's more like the guy that sits. He like talks a lot. He's great, great at having conversation. Um, but my mom is more so wants to be the life of the party, and I think I uh, sometimes overdo it on that front. <laughs> As, um... I think I'm I'm kind of. I have a lot of memories of T-Bird in a hotel room also telling me, you're a tiger, you're a tiger, and just like flashes <laughs> popping off. Like really yeah. late, like after parties too, you know, like really late at night. Yeah, taking <laughs> photos. Nice... Like... You're a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> Roar for me, Marky. Yeah. Get on your hands and knees, you're a tiger. Now go jump in that lake. Tiger can kind of swim. Right. I just kind of put two and two together. You're a pro snowboarder who has pro models. Your dad's a professional or former professional illustrator. Have you ever talked to your dad about doing a graphic for you? Yeah, yeah, he he, he helps me. We've like talked about it a lot. Um, but I think it's, I mean, just like we were just talking about how like, you know, I, I struggle and I try to be, I'm trying to be more graceful as I get older, but like, like you, like Louis, like taking instruction from a coach um, and it's harder like as a as someone's kid I think I was like like my dad would try to teach me to surf and I like hated it but I would go with my friend's dad and like I would learn how to surf and then it was like you know it just that's just kind of how it goes um but so we'll talk we'll talk about the art stuff and I'll send him like the work I do for the boots and he'll like give me references on like colors and like what colors look good together and so I take it into consideration and I would love for him to do I would love for him to do a piece for it but also like in today's world, like brands don't really, I mean, I had a pro model board, but it's, it, they don't, it's not like a year. It's not a running thing. It's not like I'm doing art every year. And some people have that. Some people don't. It's getting more rare as the time goes on. One thing I would like to see change is like, is that, but it's a big marketing game. And well, here's just a, just a quick idea while we're on it. You as a tiger wearing hockey goalie pads, full base graphic just I don't, to know if it sell. I don't know if people want to see that <laughs> i don't know if that's i don't know i wouldn't say that's sex appeal <laughs> <laughs> but as far, as far as like well even saying marketing like yeah how does it feel also to be like one of the potentially last snowboarders that's doing like has a house and a car from snowboarding i i don't know if many by yeah I think this was, I got in the tail end of like riding for Adidas and it's when they also made Adidas as a brand made a pack for like all professional athletes. Like if you wore, if you won like the Stanley cup, you get the same pay, like 
the Stanley Cup was equivalent to winning an award, like a trans world award at the time. So like the, it was equal pay across all sports. I mean, there's a reason why Adidas and Ring doesn't exist anymore. Um, that was the year you won video part of the year with Snowboarder because I had to change wording in the post yeah, so you could get incentive off of it. Yeah, contracts are gnarly. I was like, this yeah. needs to be worded like this. Um, but yeah, that was that was really cool. And sometimes I get a little bit depressed because I like think about like, wow, if I still rode for Adidas, I maybe would have another house. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But I'm but I'm not one of uh, you know I don't I don't need multiple I, I'm I like I like to be surrounded by practical nice things but not over the top things I would say so well kind of going back to those uh, those deals that you're still currently signing do you or have you ever had an agent or are you navigating this world just kind of solo I no, I have not had an agent. I'm navigating it solo with the help of like my peers and the people that I've made connections with through doing it. Like like the Tanner McCarty's and the Colleen Quigley's, like they as my team managers have also become and I owe this to probably not having an agent as well, like some of my really close friends with wonderful like business insight and also like talented snowboarders themselves. So having them in my corner and like people like them have has been such a blessing and like super helpful but i think for me i've always i will say it's getting it's getting to be a lot i've like learned i'm slowly learning how to say no which is i still tr struggle with um because i think agents are able to say no a lot for people um so no yeah i've kind of just like navigated it myself and it's been awesome like i the connections like i was saying that i've made have been some of the best connections and and everything um but I think everybody like has their own path and I will talk a lot. Like I am a talker and like, I like pretty, my social batteries, like a lot sometimes again, as I'm getting older, it's, it's slowing down or I'm more particular about where I spend it. Um, but I think agents work for some. And for me, it just like, wasn't what I wanted to do. And also like, I didn't really know about agencies until I was already at a position to where I was like negotiating those deals. So it wasn't, Dude, that's psycho that you've done so well. And I mean, you deserve everything you're you're getting. It's not like you, I know you work extremely hard, but like to do it without an agent, like if I was in your position without an agent, I would be homeless and screwed. I, <laughs> homeless and screwed <laughs> and a tiger. I, uh. Still a tiger, yeah. I will say like, like, I, like it is getting to a point, like after just putting on this event last weekend, like it's just, luckily I've had a lot of, like with the event, the roundup we just did, with Stance and Woodward and other people too, like it was a lot. And, and like, you know, and like, just like even like booking flights and then like being on a one trip and then like booking a trip back to back and like, like, you know, and I'm not too sure like what agents do. I actually am like really curious about it. Like I have been talking to my friend who is an agent and I'm, I kind of want to like shadow and just like see like what that entails. Cause it does interest me somewhat like just like, you know, not that I want to hang up the hat on like, being a snowboarder, but just, I think from doing it myself, I'm like, oh, I would well, love to do this, but like other people, I just like, don't really know other than my own experiences, like what that looks like on like the paperwork end of things. Um, but yeah, so if you're an agency and you're looking for, you know, some, someone to do some underpaid work, <laughs> all right, your girl. I can. You see, have a pretty impressive resume. Yeah. I'll go I, I could see you and Cersei Wallace hitting it off really well. You should hit up Cersei. She's probably got some good insight because same path, right? Like legendary yeah. pioneer, professional snowboarder and went on in her whole career is just advocating for athletes and making sure they get what they, what they deserve and what they're worth. And that's something I struggle with as a freelancer. Like give me advice on how to like advocate for myself. I'm so fucking bad when someone's like, sell yourself to me. I just clam up. I'm like, uh, I'm like kind of good at this stuff, but I also kind of suck. Like I'm, I just start rambling yeah. and it, it's a hard thing to do. Advocate for yourself. I think I'm, like, like I've never had representation from an agency, but like I have a relationship with Cersei as well. Like she's, I've called her and like, she's walked me through things. Like there's, I've talked to Bear Christie. Like I have, these people have been so generous, like to do, like to hear me out and like guide me, you know, without like being contractually obliged to them. Um, I remember like, I think really, I was like kind of always interested in doing it myself. And then it, I remember oh, years ago now, like I called Leanne and I was like, hey, like 
this company's asking me to do something like for this amount of money, like what, like kind of because of snowboarding, like no one really knows it's not on paper, like how much, like this is, this is worth this much. This is worth that much. You know, like it is. It's not like basketball. It's not like basketball. It's like an asking game and you kind of just have to figure out like what your worth is. And I think like a little insight, like what helped me was I started when I was like doing, you know, like, like when contracts are up or I'm starting to sign a new deal, I really like think about all, like look at the website and like see where this brand is. And like, uh, instead of having somebody, you know, if we have, if I have a meeting like to connect about a contract, I will do the best I can to figure out what they need, like where the brand is lacking or where they maybe not lacking, but where they can excel or just like miss marks, like, you know, like margins of the sport or the community that they don't fill. And then kind of like, breaking that down to see like how I can fill that or like how we can build a team to like fill that. And so instead of like, instead of them being like, what can you do for us? Like I try to go to them with like, Hey, this is what I can do for you. And it's not necessarily like a personal thing, but I'll be like, Hey, I, I recognize that like the representation in like women's street snowboarding isn't quite there. Like this is what I can do for you. And like also get other people involved. I don't know that that's like really helped me rather than being getting caught off guard and being like, sell yourself like give me your elevator speech um no. that's not comfortable for anybody you know oh, the fucking you, worst yeah do you think you'd ever go back to school to finish like a business like if you have aspirations of potentially doing agency or you know working on the business side later would you go back to school to finish your degree or no you know i think i i definitely would go i definitely want like I, right now i want to go back to school i don't know if it would be like if it was going to be like sports marketing and like managing stuff, it would be more so if I like made a connection with a job or like they were like, hey, we need you to get this degree. Then I would go right. for that. Yeah, because you already have the practical training. Yeah. Yeah. And and like, I, I mean, just like being in this community, uh, like there's so many people without degrees that do really well and do a lot better than people with degrees. Not to say that degrees are invalid because, you know, having a higher education is super important um my education path has just been different um but i think like if i were to go back to school like like collegiate school i think it would be more for something like that i don't have any experience in or it would be in like trade and just like maybe like shadowing or like trade school i don't know something something different i got a two-parter here um have you ever in your opinion have you put out a video part that you're 100 percent comfortable with Second part of that question is knowing how you are your own biggest self-critic and you're such a perfectionist and you want to do things a certain way. Is that possible to you? Oof, that's a tricky question. Um, there's a short answer and a long answer, I would say. Like, no. Short answer being no. Like, I've never filmed. I've yet to film my favorite part. Let's We could start there. Um, and I also think video parts are kind of like aged wine, if you will. Like, it's such... Filming a street video part for snowboarding is such a small time frame. And so like to be able to like mentally and emotionally digest like all the energy and hard work and like blood, sweat and tears you put into it. Like, I don't know if any of my peers, I don't know if anybody has ever felt that. I'm sure there are, but you know, everyone that I've spoken to, it isn't. And for me personally, I think the dust box part, for example, like filming it, like I wasn't in the moment. I was like from day to day while filming and it was like, I was checking off a list, right? Like it was like, okay, like that was, I'm glad I did that. Like, ooh, got away with that one. Like I'm I'm hyped on that one. But like by the time it was like edited and now I wasn't like, I mean, it wasn't like the day of the premiere, I was on the phone with like the editor, like Colton being like, I, I hate my song. Like I hate this, you know, just kind of criticizing, you know, myself. And as time goes on, like I can go back to that part and be like, I really like that part. Like, you know, like I, I, I don't hate it. Like I had a great winter with the guys, like, but in the moment, like, no, I wasn't proud. Like, I was not, like, so hyped for the world to see it, you know? Um, yeah, well, for the record, I don't think I've ever asked a street snowboarder or a backcountry snowboarder that question and had them say definitively, like, yeah, I filmed my best part. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of the point of the question. It's the type of people that become professional snowboarders will probably never think in the moment that this is the best part. I'm totally satisfied. They're always looking for more. But they can go back in hindsight and retrospect and be like, ah, oh, shit, maybe that was my best part or as close as I could get to it. Yeah, I would say like looking back over the years, like there's there's things in the parts that I film that I am proud of, you know, and a lot of them 
go hand in hand with like the struggle, like the most struggling spots that I had hit, you know? And uh, I would say too, like the rated R movie, I think I, I didn't have much. I was like happy with the things that I did, but in the moment, and I'm still like not fully confident in it, but like in the moment I wasn't confident in them. I mean, there was like maybe two things in particular where I was like, oh, that was like, oh, I'm glad I did that. And I'm glad I did that quickly because I was scared. Um, but yeah, no, I wouldn't say like hands down, like, like that is, I have a, no, I, the best part will always be yet to be filmed. <laughs> <laughs> your parts are all very sick if i had one clip from one of your parts from your very first part i would be i would be retired like i'm i mean done. clavin i can say a uh, clavin i can say the same thing about you if i was if i had a clip that was me wearing a red bull helmet taking a kink rail directly to my butthole i could die a happy man i have filmed my best parts uh <laughs> i know that for a fact and when i was doing it i know i am now filming my worst part and you know whatever it well, doesn't Mark, I, I, how Okay, I've I've been in your position many times where people are like, D-Bird, hit this. And I'm like, fuck no, I'm not going to hit this. How do you get peer pressured so easily into hitting the <laughs> psycho features? It's it's not peer pressure. It's you, when people pressure you at the end of the day, there's still, you know, this respect and this talent that you fall back on where you're like, well, I can, you know, call tricks or I can take their photos wonderfully. I have nothing to fall back on. I, I just have to go, okay, yeah, I'm going to hit this. And Did you do Rich, it to prove yourself? Is it to prove yourself? Or is it is it for the comedic relief that everyone and yourself I, get? Honestly, to be quite honest, I do it because I truly believe I can do it. Because <laughs> I, I, at one point, was a very confident snowboarder. Um, yeah, now that I'm getting older and those injuries have slowly worn and you know torn me down, I definitely am... I don't really talk much when we're near spots. I don't ever say like, oh, that looks fun. Or like, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I just, I always you know, say, yeah, you got it. You're good. All right. Hey, I will say though to you both, I think snowboarding around a mountain and lugging around your 80 pound bags is a trick in itself. I've had to, my hand, we went down this the other day. We were like, oh, we went down this little slope. We hiked out, realized that the snow was like not safe. And there was this little hill. And I saw him, he had his bag, and I was like, Meyer, give me your bag. You can, like, go down this. Like, I put that thing on and just, like, oosh, like, sunk. Like, oh. And I, I was terrified. I was like, I'm going to go down on this money bag. Pretty Meyer, much. like, in another world could be, like, a Mount Everest Sherpa. Like, that dude is so uh, resilient. Like, his, pa his pack is so heavy and never slows him down. I think oh. the photo yeah. side is lighter than the video side. I will say that. The photo side, I think I weighed mine this year uh, at Natural Selection because we had to get weighed in for the heli. And I think with my pack alone was like 42, 43. But it, I, the video dudes, like Scott Barber's, was like 87. Like it was so no, we, we can't say anything around. And also, you haven't even fully switched to mirrorless. Your pack will just keep getting lighter. Yeah, yeah day, day. Day. Uh, you know, but it's kind of like swinging with a weighted bat. You would, so I understand, Mark, how you feel juice to do these things when you put the bag down because you probably feel I well, well, like sounds lighter. <laughs> dude, I'm from the Midwest. All we did was little rails. Like honestly, most rails when I would step up to them, I was like, I got this. I can, I can board slide this. Like I'd feel very confident, but it, it never really worked out. Yeah. How do you feel that like Stan Levier is getting like better at snowboarding? Like better than you mark he is he's he always is. it's not he's not getting better than me he's always been better than me any crew i've ever been with i am the worst snowboarder in the group and i fully accepted that i'm okay with that stan's method like the first time we ever rode together amazing t-bird one time asked me to do a method and i could hear them laughing until i went to sleep that night it was <laughs> in the morning it honestly looked like if you took a newborn deer and like threw it through the air it was like this wild like movement of limbs, like your body didn't know like how to react to grab method. Somehow I just I, I'm in the air and like, why am I grabbing Tindy? Yeah, oh I feel that. I feel that. Sometimes it's just like, whoop, surprise, there it is. The Meyer thing though reminded me. Um wait, are you filming for VG this year? I I I, I am I I am I was filming for VG this year until I got hurt, but yes, I am I have been doing that and it's been awesome. Oh yeah, how sorry to how'd you get hurt? That's okay. Um, we were filming. I was actually on a van strip. I was taking a little. I was. I was uh, solidifying the contract. And no, I, I got to work with Harry. We went on a trip to shoot some boots and do stuff. I ended up 
fracturing my ankle and then, you know, hitting the denial button and saying it's not broken for about seven weeks. So now I'm just restarting the uh, healing process, but it's all good. I, uh, you know, we got filming for VG. We went on a couple early trips, like getting to work with Meyer, like absolute legend has been awesome. And I remember like going into the year kind of being like, oh, like, I think I'm going to take a sabbatical or just, you know, like learn to ride the mountain, like kind of just. I need to like reassess like where, what I want to do now. And when I got the call to be a part of VG, like it was pretty impossible to say no, Um, especially just like working with such an esteemed crew of people, you know, like getting to work with Lewif again. I always love to work with him when I can. Um, And I didn't see him so much this year. I saw him a couple weeks back when I was still injured, but it was nice to see him. And like Jed and Tommy and Reed and Dan, I don't know. It's just, it's really cool. And I'm excited about that. There's some new people involved. Justin Phipps is an absolute freak. And so it's cool. It, it's been really cool to like be a part of that. Uh, like, like, I don't, I'd like just be a part you're, of video. You. You're, you're probably someone that's like, go, 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 go. In a weird way, does an injury, is an injury almost kind of good? for you in a weird way because it just makes you like slow down and kind of reset and heal your body and then when you're back you're better than ever yeah I think I mean better than ever is kind of a stretch but I do think like leading up to I was talking to some people and just like last year and like I forgot this um because I remember this going into this year I was like, oh I'm, I'm like kind of over it like this is like a lot like my body like I'm always sore like I'm doing the best I can like it's getting really gnarly um, and it just started to get like overwhelming and because it's been like just back to back years and with injuries, like I've been injured in the past as well. And I do know that like injuries do grow you as a person and like the time takes to slow down. But for sure, I think the break that I've had with this injury, even though it was like not really a break, um, it was like a physical break, but like the brands find out you're injured and then all of a sudden they like, you're on a flight to go do an interview. You know, you're not, it's not really a break, but I guess to answer that question, Bird, like being injured as like a professional athlete is kind of the only way you get a chance to slow down, unfortunately, um, because it is at the toll of your body and mental health. And you, as somebody who like knows, like I need to slow down or I need to do something, it's really hard to do that when there's expectations that you place on yourself and you feel like others place on you as well, especially coming from brands and support and like, like, consumers of snowboarder snowboarding um so yeah I think it's been really nice and I've enjoyed my time kind of like honing in and like focusing on myself but it's not it's not like easy I'm not like yeah I'm injured you know I still like have to walk with a limp and my hips are all out of place and it's not yeah I, th- I think some brands would get a little bummed as you're walking around being like yeah I'm injured like that's that's kind of like fraud I guess or something it's like just fraud. like it is it is yeah, just exploiting your own company. Wait, but you you broke your foot on a van shoot on a boot shoot. Uh, so that's I, hysterical. Yes, but but I was it was a snowboard shoot. Like we were snowboarding. Was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, like specifically, you're like I'm using this product to protect my feet, and then you break your. That's yeah, well, the, this get this is the kicker. So we go on this van shoot. We go to uh Finland, and it was sick place. I I was like I got injured really early on. It was like it was like. A one-two punch. I got there, hit a spot. It worked out. Um, I was in the old boots because we were preserving the new boots to shoot. So they didn't. We didn't want to ruin them, right? So like, we're like we'll just do it at the end of the trip. Like no big deal. And I'm and every day we should probably put the boots on. Like let's get some assets because we didn't really get them the year prior. So I was like kind of stressed about that. So got a clip, whatever. Then the next next spot I hit, I got a black eye. I got taken out and got a hit the corner of a metal building and that wasn't chill. Um, I was fine. I just had like a, a goose egg on my head the size of a softball and then it bled into my face and that was a sight to see. Um, and then gave that a couple of days and then immediately, yeah, broke my ankle. So <laughs> it, that was not the best display of my... So we're... <laughs> Peeber's gotten most of it. Peeber's had the very good questions that you've had very amazing answers too so i have one more as far as um like you were talking earlier about trips close to home versus trips far because obviously you've traveled the world for snowboarding do you like when you're on a street trip like do you enjoy just kind of hitting stuff close like do you like going to minnesota or are you more up for like the finland stuff and has that changed as you've gotten older 
Uh, yes, it's definitely changed. I think last year, actually filming for Ride, we had like a wonder. We had a great winter here in Utah, and it was like the first time I've ever got to like go hit a spa and then sleep in my own bed. And bef- and that was amazing. Like I was like, oh my gosh, this is. If only we could do this every day, like that would be awesome. But before that, I struggled with like the drive of wanting to go hit something that was like in my backyard pretty much. Um, So I was so big on, and I still am, but I was really big on like getting like mindset filming video parts is super important. So like when I was like packing my bag, getting on a plane, going to a destination, it was almost like, okay, now the work starts. Like, and then when I'm home, it's like, okay, I get to go to the resort and I get to like decompress and I get to practice my craft. Um, So, like, I am a huge fan of, like, going to different countries and going, you know, I guess we're talking about, like, the far travels, yeah, like, going, we went to Stockholm, we went to Oslo, we went to Finland this year, we, like, did that, and also, like, just the different type of, like, architecture that's around. Um, Yeah, super inspiring, for sure. It's super inspiring, and it's just, like, it it opens the mind into, like, this other creativity, uh, creative realm. Um, and it's, it's just exciting. It's like not something I, it's not like I'm driving by the cafe espresso down the street every day being that I want, I'm waiting for the day to hit the rail at the cafe espresso, you know, like it's, yeah. it's just more fun. And then it's funny because Minnesota last year, I know I mentioned like that was the last time I shot with bird and also like such a great trip. I hated, not that I hated Minnesota as a whole, but I was like, I can never go to film in Minnesota again. And I would be happy. Like, sure. I would go to, you know, for like troll and Highland and the ropes and the vibes and I would love that, but Minnesota is such another hub for like street snowboarding and like a lot of the spots there have been annihilated and yes, there's like more coming and you can like always dig a little bit deeper, but I was like pretty anti that. Um, But looking back, like I'm glad I did it. Like half my part is filming in Minnesota for the ride video. So it's, I can't, can't really say that. Um, So I don't know. It's, it's, I don't really have like a real strong opinion on which I like more. Um, but do you have a place you're looking to go that you would say out loud? Like, I know people keep, you guys keep your spots semi secret, correct? Like where you want to go. Yeah. It's getting, it's, it's, that's probably like one of the most annoying. I hate that part. Like the, the secrecy behind it is annoying, but I, but I understand it, you know? Um, because everything is, we're in a world right now in street snowboarding where everything kind of like looks the same. And like, so we're trying to figure that out as you know, as snowboarders um but yeah no i i mean i got hurt in finland and i am so bummed because i would love to have filmed there like you know and so i'm really looking forward to going back there and and filming there's there's that's about all i'll say about it i guess <laughs> I feel like, yeah, you got some spots in finland yeah so yeah i feel like from a photographer's spe- perspective i mean it changed once i had a kid right the international travel gets a little a little tougher as the kid gets older and more dependent on you and you, you want to be there. But I always liked going to like Europe or Japan because the way that I kind of saw it photographically is the prototypical U.S. city is very industrial and the prototypical European city is much more architectural. And so it just provides like a better landscape, a better backdrop. And then on top of that, you're like, there's new people, there's a different language, there's there's different food, different art, different music that you're listening to. It just, it felt like you could step outside your comfort zone and kind of um, practice your craft in a new arena rather than going to Minnesota or going to Omaha or going to, you know, and there are certain cities like I, one of my bucket list goals, I want to go shoot in Pittsburgh because that city to me is so industrial and I've heard it's super hilly and there's just unlimited spots there. I want to photograph that. As much as I want to go to another European city. So kind of a case by case basis, right? Yeah. And I think, I mean, with with everything and like snowboarding getting really intense and really gnarly, it, there's a lot of people like using the beauty and like the art aspect, you know, of the landscape, of the architecture, like using that to your advantage can set people apart and like, you know, like show more than just a down rail in a park or next like a commercial building. And And I think really just depends on the person like what they're looking for and like their eye to like create a cohesive video part or movie um so it's interesting like i'm definitely more drawn to that but i also hold to a high importance that like showcasing like your skill set as well is 
you know, hand in hand, like they're, they're both important. And if you can find a spot that's like beautiful and you can do a sick trick on it, like that's, that's the money maker. Um, so. Fish eye, fish eye spots look the same uh, wherever you are in the world. So I just slap a fish eye and I can say I'm, I'm in Japan when I'm in Omaha. Yeah. It's a mystery. Yeah. Um, Julie, uh, seeing as we're just at, at about, just about at the hour mark, we don't want to take up too much of your time, but I do want to talk about the roundup. This was, as far as I know, your first big, like Jill Perkins marquee event, correct? Correct. Yeah. This was, this was my first event and, um, it, I would say it couldn't have happened at a better time, but it definitely could have, I would say, uh, I had complete FOMO watching everybody like destroy the pipe. It was so sick. We did it. Stance partnered up. I partnered up with Stance and Woodward and School Candy helped out as well. Um, and we did like a 16 foot mini pipe situation. And it was like the best the pipe was ever cut. And like the riders were absolutely killing it and like having the best time. It was a two day event. We had like an after party at Nebo Salt Lake um, with like a mechanical ball and the awards. And and it was really, I hate to use the word cute, but it was like really cute. We had like the kids involved and their parents and like, they were so, so hyped. We Stance like gave me cash, like hand out. And it was, it was really cool. I mean, I say bad timing just because of my personal selfish injury. Um, mini pipe riding is like some of my favorite, like transition riding, I think is like, you don't see it as much anymore. And I think it's really cool. And like people's individual styles are really on like the big, you know, the stage at the point. Um, so it was awesome and we were supposed to have like really shit weather and the first day was like sunny and slushy and like just good good energy um, and the second day it was like snowing and then like it stopped for the event and then it started as soon as the event was done and it, it just like kind of like fell into place I had uh, really good help you know Taylor Elliott killed it um, and it was cool it was a lot of it was a lot of work I understand now and I apologize let me say this. I apologize for calling anybody who ever put on an event and and I was the one blowing your phone up the day of. Because it's really bad. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. It, was, oh, yeah. it was a fucking nightmare. You know, I'm like, what time is the event at? I'm like, check the internet. I don't know. It's it's like. Just turn your phone off next year. Can you, yeah. Or the, or the hey, we're on our way. Can you, can you keep registration open for another 20 minutes? And you're like, no, I actually can't. No, I can't. I actually have to be, if, you know, if I, there was like three of me and I could be at three places at once. Great. But that's just not realistic. Um, so it was, it's a lot of work. Uh, like I said, I had a lot of really good help and people involved, but it was really cool to experience it because I think ultimately that is something that's like just bigger than physically snowboarding and just giving back to the community. And I think after you've just been physically snowboarding for so long, like you, I was searching for, you know, like I, I, I'm constantly searching for like some sort of purpose. And I think doing community events is like one way to like give back and like in return, like feel like you're doing something bigger than yourself. And and so it was cool. It was a lot of pressure, but it, I think it worked out really well. Well, and on that topic, I mean, the inclusivity and the relatability of, of a grassroots event like that is so important, I think, for the consumer, for the audience, because you can go to the X Games and experience it. You can go to Natural Selection Tour and you can experience it, but you really can't participate. The yeah. participation factor of it, that's like core memories for kids that are going to be like, I was riding the same half pipe as so-and-so on this one day, you know? Exactly. And they were so hyped on it. And it was like, it was, it was, it was adorable. It was, it was awesome. And then like for the pros and the, the riders that were involved, like, seeing we saw some like we saw amazing pipe riding you know or like my graph set to, told me not to call it a mini pipe so now i feel hesitant because like it's not it's not small it's not 22 everything's just getting yeah. these days it was you know it's, six, uh, it's a mid pipe because there's mini yeah. pipe is 12 mid yeah. would be 16 yeah. super pipes 22 yeah i would yeah, not call it a 16 foot pipe mini i would get hurt on that easily yeah yeah it, but it was it was necessary it was really cool because you know, having the bigger walls like allowed for bigger tricks. And I, I kind of wanted to see that and we definitely did. Um, so it was, it was, it was cool. And then the after party was super fun. The mechanical bull was a hit. I think I, I enjoy throwing parties. I think they're really fun, but I always have to make sure there's an activity at the party because if the party's not good enough, at least there's an activity. <laughs> <laughs> um, so no, it was, it was a really good time. Who got uh, bucked off the bull the hardest? 
I mean, when I think about the bull riding, all I think about is Pat Bridges because it was just hilarious. Pat got on there twice. Bridges got on the. Oh Bridges God. got on the bull. First time he got on by himself, like he was like, "I'm gonna ride this bull." Everyone kind of was like, "Like okay, Pat." Like that's he's just been warming wild. up in Tahoe for months. Dude, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was. He doesn't proud. do anything not calculated. Yeah. He was, he killed it. He was, you know, he had his time rail on his phone. You know, he like made it into a competition with himself and others. Cause then he was like, you know, like kind of like spying on people from the back, like seeing if they did better than him. Um, but the thing about the bull was Stan brought it up to me and he was like, yeah, I was like really scared of the horns because <laughs> it was like real horns on this bull. And like, you could go, you could go overboard. So I was like, all right, Stan, a way to assess the risk factors here. Uh, <laughs> He's just afraid because when he goes to contests, he loses teeth. Yeah, he loses, he, he's, he's, he can't be losing any any more of those things. He doesn't have many left. So we try to keep him in the mouth. Um, Katie was up on the bowl, obviously, all night. was loving it. Everyone did really – everyone everyone enjoyed it. Yeah. So the, the uh, snowboard scene is alive and well in Salt Lake. It is alive and well, and I don't think it's going anywhere. Going anywhere. We were joking. McKenna from School Candy texted me, and she was like, Thank you for throwing the party of my dreams, like a mechanical bowl, a dance party, and a band, and food, and drinks. I was like, yep, we got it all, like, you know? And then I was like, we were joking about it. I was like, yeah, you build it, and they will come, and they will not leave. Like, they yeah. will not leave. <laughs> they will literally never leave yeah. once you close the bar. Yeah, yeah, but it was cool. Very, uh, Yeah, that's awesome. Last but not least, uh, have you been paying attention to our um... – well, we've just hit the final four in our in our national championship snowboard mag uh, contest. Yes, you know I was really confused at first, and then I realized that like it, it it's around March Madness, right? Is that what the whole thing is? Okay, yeah. I started figuring it out because I was like, did somebody make me the Longhorns because I like the want? I'm kind of like a country girl. Or no, wait, where did this country thing come from? You are are you are you a country uh, girl? When I was younger, I was. Like I listen to country, I will proudly announce that. Um, when I was younger, I loved it, and I thought I was going to be married, live on a farm, and have like three kids by the time I was twenty three. And like, my husband would be like working on the cars, and I would like ring the dinner bell. I, clearly, <laughs> clearly things have changed. Wow, yeah. And I don't now you're the one into the country lifestyle, but I identified with it. <laughs> yeah, California country, and now you're the one into cars. Uh, yeah, I kind of like cars. I kind of want to get another car. Yeah, but I, I uh, yeah, I don't know anything about it. I just think I, I kind of like the styles of the different cars. And I recently you, got. Yeah, what I are you looking at? Bronco last summer, and I'm obsessed with it. It's my city getter, my grocery getter. Um, but I don't know. I'm looking at like the later '80s, like Mercedes two door convertible stick shifts. Haven't really come down between that. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I really like those gold. I like gold. Did you put a did you put a POW sticker on the back of your Bronco? No, I don't have any stickers on my Bronco. That thing is in mint condition. Okay. Is it uh is it garaged or outside parking? It's currently outside, but it's garaged in the winter. Um but I my garage is a mess because I've been building things and on one leg. So I just kind of like build it and then leave it for a couple months. <laughs> Uh, well, Jilly, we can't thank you enough for coming on. Um, you're the best. We love you. So damn proud of you. You've earned everything, and we appreciate you. Thanks, guys. No, congrats to you both. I mean, it's been an honor growing with both of you and seeing the different changes you guys have made as well. And I think this is really exciting. And thank you for having me be a part of it. Um, and I'm I'm excited to see what you guys do. This is awesome. There it was, dude. Jilly P, one of my absolute favorite human beings on planet Earth. I had such a good run with Jill at Ride, and I'm just so fucking proud of her and stoked to see like the person that she's become, not just the snowboarder that she's become. Yeah, you've known her like since she moved to Salt Lake, yeah? I think so, yeah. It might have been a year or two afterward. And that's when I, you know, Tanner McCarty hit me up to be the team photographer at Ride, and I think the first two team riders I shot with at Ride were... Um, Cole Navin and Jill in like the same winter, which is pretty wild to think about. Oh, I meant to actually say this when we were talking to her, but um, yeah, your guys' photo last year, the uh, she was on that white, like the white kink rail. Yeah. Was in contention, I think, for a cover at like basically every single magazine. Oh. I know you guys all, everyone always hates hearing that, but I was like, oh yeah, that was like almost a cover with us for sure. 
Um, and I heard rumors that it was almost a cover at the other two as well. <laughs> um, it it is one of my favorite photos I've taken in my like 15 year career shooting photos. Like not not just because of what it was, but who it was too. That kind of plays a factor into it when you have a history with someone and you get a photo that you're really stoked on of a person that you're really stoked on. It just kind of makes the formula works perfectly, you know. And that's that's what it always was with Jill. She always produced man she's just so professional and so fucking skilled and she cares about all of the people documenting her as much as she cares about you know herself landing the trick it's really cool yeah it's crazy to hear to think also just about what she wants to do next even though she definitely still has a ton of you know runway for like yeah i'm i'm very excited to see just what she does she's already putting together big big roundup you know events and all that stuff yeah, and I think that side of her snowboarding and her persona is only going to grow exponentially year over year. Like that roundup thing, it, it's really hard for me to get FOMO, you know, after doing it for 20 plus years. And there's times where I'm like, oh, it looks like it would be fun to be at, but eh, no need. That was not the case for the roundup. I was looking at like her on the mic with Stan, <clears throat> a slushy mini pipe at Woodward uh, Park City. And I was just like, fuck, that looks really fun. I really wish I was there right now. For sure. Another episode in the bag. I don't know how, how we're supposed to end these yet. Uh, we still don't have a jingle, so we can't really do an outro song. Yeah, we do need a jingle. Um, I, I think that'll just happen, you know? I think it'll happen organically once we start putting these out. Um, but yeah, episode two of Mark My Bird, the Snowboard Mag podcast, is in the books. Uh, we got some exciting guests coming up next. We're going to tell you who they are once you see them on Instagram, basically. And uh, if you have a jingle, please send it our way. All right, Mark. Um, I'll talk to you soon, buddy. I think we have a meeting in a couple hours anyway, so I'll see you on another Zoom today. Yep. Zoom to Zoom. Later. Later, buddy.